we, we've been around and making financial markets work for the poor for, for the last 20, over the last 20 years. And the remittances work and cross-border payments work has been part of that journey. Um, certainly the first substantial work that I had to do when I came into Finmark 10 years ago. Um, the first cross-border remittance uh, report was produced in 2006. Um, uh, and, and which and, and that report first raised the, the volumes and values of cross-border remittances from South Africa. Um, at that time, the projection was around 6 billion rand that went annually uh, from South Africa um, uh, into the region. Uh, at, the, at the moment, those estimates are around 20 billion going annually from South Africa into the region. At the time, some of the key blockages that were raised by the work, uh, initial work that we did was around the lack of competition in the cross-border space. Uh, some of my colleagues from the Reserve Bank may remember those days um, where banks were the only game in town. Uh, Non-banks weren't even playing in that space uh, at the time. And we were sitting with transaction costs of above 20%. Um, and 20% uh, in the formal market, which was at the time around 20% of the cross-border market, uh, but also the 80% of the informal market was was just as high. So the lack of competition um, uh, in the forex market was identified. Uh, AML regulations at the time uh, um, were quite stringent, and they basically shut out uh, migrants um, uh, from the formal systems. Over the last decade or so, we've worked very hard with, with our partners, um, uh, the South African Reserve Bank, the SADC uh, uh, Payments Subcommittee, the Financial Intelligence Center, um, uh, uh, our National Treasury, uh, and of course the private sector. Um, over the years, we've worked very hard to try and deal with these issues. Um, the licensing regime, I think, was was changed in around 2015, 2016, if my memory uh, serves me correctly. Um, it's been a, it's been a long time, so I may have got those dates slightly wrong, but it was around about that time when the market was opened up, and I think that was the first um, major change where uh, non banks were allowed, you, you know, were allowed into the space. I think we now have something like four categories of Adler licenses, um, and that has created a sea change in the space. And over the years, it's the non-banks that have uh, have innovated in this market, have uh, you know slowly driven the cost down, um, and we are hoping that they will drive you know drive the cost down even more. AML regulations changed, uh, I think, a year or so after that. Um, first through exemptions, uh, you, you know, to the regulations cross border. And then with the introduction of the risk-based approach to AML CFT, um, uh, and and currently you know that is being implemented, and again it's opened up you, you, know, you know the space where where even undocumented migrants can today use the formal systems. Um, those are huge achievements, I think, that were um, you, you know you know brought about over more than a decade of very very hard work. We learned some key lessons through that period uh, of our work. Um, Data is improving. When we started this journey uh, 10, 15 years ago, um, data was not um, readily available. Data on the number of migrants in the country, data on the formal remittances. Uh, at the time, the Reserve Bank was not collecting the data as systematically as it does now. Um, uh, and, and of course, the, the number of um, uh, 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 informal remittances as well. That has changed over the years, and I think our estimates at the moment are, are a lot more accurate. Um, and certainly the Reserve Bank systems have been improved substantially and is able to give us, you know, you know, very good data that we will uh, share with you today as well. That's what we've learned uh, over the last while. Uh, Non-banks are, as I said, the ones that are innovating. Um, I'm not sure uh, why the banks are being left behind in this space, but you'll see from the results again, who has the lion's share of uh, cross-border remittances. Um, one of the learnings is that if we want to include increase financial inclusion across the SADC region, 
uh, cross-border remittances is an important way uh, to do that. I think um, the number of Zimbabweans, for example, who have been financially included in South Africa, as well as their families back home through remittances, through formal remittances, has been an important learning. There is still a lot of work to be done. And as you'll see from the results, we've made huge progress. We have reduced the cost of cross-border remittances by, by over 50% over the last decade. We still have some way to go, but I think everybody involved um, uh, should be proud of the work that we've done over the last uh, decade or so. Um, the last learning is that impacts like this come through partnerships and long-term partnerships. They are not partnerships that last for a year or two, so this process of dipping in and out doesn't work. The partnerships that we've developed are in excess of 10 years, and it's that working together that brings the results that we need. With those few words, I'm going to introduce uh, the agenda for today. We are going to have um, as our keynote speaker, uh, Mr. Tim Marcella, who's the head of the SADC uh, Payments System Department. The Reserve Bank, he also chairs the SADC uh, um, Payment System Subcommittee. And Tim has been a partner in this journey from, from the beginning. And so he knows the good, the bad, and the ugly of what went down. He's going to be our, our, our keynote speaker. We're then going to have uh, Damola Olade, who is uh, the uh, manager of the SADC uh, Financial Inclusion Program at Finmont Trust. He will present the results for us. That will be followed by a panel discussion uh, facilitated by uh, Mr. Tulasizwe Sinelani, who I'm sure uh, requires no introduction to especially South Africans, he comes into our living rooms uh, uh, on a daily basis um, uh, with the uh, uh, ENCA. He will facilitate that. Uh, we have the, the panel, four panel, uh, panel members on the screen. And then Nikki Kettles, who is our executive for programs, will close off the day for us. That's the program for the day. In terms of house rules, please feel free to post questions on the chat. We have a, 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 a back room, a back office team who's going to be addressing your questions that you pose on the chat. We will share both the recording and the presentation uh, after after this event for you to to have at your uh, and to look at uh, at your leisure. We have muted um, by default. Uh, if there's anyone with any burning questions or comments, uh, please feel free to raise your hand and I will try to find you and give you an opportunity to speak. Um, with that introduction, I'm going to call on uh, Mr. Tim Marcella to give us his keynote address. Thank you. Over to you, Tim. Thanks, Brandon. And uh, always uh, glad to engage with this community on these important matters. And uh, I would like to uh, greet uh, fellow regulators, distinguished guests, and say that uh, we're looking forward to the juicy statistics that uh, the Finmark team is going to be sharing with us. From my side, I appreciate this opportunity to offer these speaking remarks at the opening of this session, specifically looking at uh, progress that we are making in terms of uh, unblocking some of the blockages relating to remittance flows in the SADC region. I must say that uh, I have had advantage of working with some of you on these matters through various initiatives aligned to the work of the Southern African Development Community Payment System Subcommittee. <clears throat> I, I presume that uh, <clears throat> it is an accepted position that remittances from migrants are a vital source of income support for many families within communities in sub-Saharan Africa, as it is in other parts of the world. It is further acknowledged that remittance services offerings should be convenient, affordable, accessible, and provided through transparent channels as well as being executed or concluded within acceptable turnaround times. <clears throat> it is further important to note that remittance costs, reduction objectives, 
have been adopted as formal objectives by several international organizations, including the United Nations, the G20, and the Southern African Development Community and various initiatives are uh, and should be underway to realize these objectives. In SADC, we recognize that a review of the broader regulatory environment should unlock some of the blockages that will enable leveraging of effective remittance services. Research further suggests that aspects relating to anti money laundering legislation continues to be one of the key sources of concern for the healthy development of remittance markets. Within SADC, average transaction sizes of remittances are smaller than the international average and are trending closer to the 55 US dollar figure as opposed to the typical 200 US dollar transactions average as per Finmark Trust research which figure of 55 US dollars is presumed to focus on services provided by these uh, migrants within our region, while within the international community, the US dollar average is the amount that is normally transacted through international institutions. Factors that have an impact on the increase of transaction costs thus have a proportionally larger impact on the cost of transactions in SADC as opposed to the rest of the world. While some stakeholders hold a, a firm view that South African legislation allows authorized financial institutions to use a risk-based approach to AML, which in turn should reduce the regulatory burden for smaller transactions, this understanding is not shared by the authorized dealers in our market. In the stakeholder interviews for the research undertaken by Finmark Trust, representatives of the authorized dealers expressed a concern about the fairness of the competition from the authorized dealers with limited authority as they felt they were not able to use the less restrictive risk-based approach to offering the services in our market. Recent research revealed that prices of remittance services are affected by several factors, which may include <clears throat> the level of competition experienced in each market segment and the extent to which regulatory requirements increase transaction costs that is being of the most important and prominent cost determinants. A further area <clears throat> that requires collaboration, collaborative action of the stakeholders in the remittance market relate to the removal of friction in the first and last mile of the value chain. In this area, there is an observation of the cash in cash out phenomenon in the remittance value chain that has a significant cost impact. It is thus imperative that efforts be directed at digitization of these segments of the value chain. And there is of course realization that efforts that will have a meaningful impact would need to be integrated in the broader digitization initiatives without losing the focus on the desired outcome. This, however, <clears throat> departs from a position that assumes that efforts geared towards implementation of effective middle mile infrastructure are well underway, or it assumes that the middle mile infrastructure is effective to yield the desired outcome. It would, however, be noted that some achievements have been realized in the past and in terms of the middle mile infrastructure, we are aware of initiatives that are currently underway that should indeed result in effective realization of the 
objectives that we desire in terms of having effective and secure services offered to the consumers of remittance services. We note that some achievements have been realized in the past that uh, form the foundation of future work that needs to be taken forward. This includes, among others, the introduction of non-bank authorization and licensing for authorized dealers with limited authority to undertake remittances in their own right. That is uh, the services that uh, the, the dispensation that was brought in in the 2014-2015 timeline. And in this regard, these parties are able to offer these service, services without partnering with a bank and, as I indicated, ensuring that uh, we are able to bring effectiveness in the space. Further, there's been bank retailer partnership models that have been introduced. For instance, one can mention the South Africa Lesotho Corridor that was introduced in 2015, as well as the South Africa Eswatini Corridor that was introduced later in, 20, in the timelines of 2019. Over and above this, the FIC uh, requirements and amendments that allowed risk-based approach to risk assessment has also yielded some positive results. And uh, we know that this dispensation was introduced in 2017, although it still needs to be bedded down. We, however, know that uh, sustained success of this work <clears throat> will depend heavily on the commitment of the public authorities and the private sector working together. Our collective efforts and actions will be required to implement the agreed interventions and changes in the coming years to achieve the targets that we should agree upon upfront. Amongst these, central banks must enhance their regulatory frameworks or continue to enhance their regulatory frameworks to ensure that they are enabling in the first and last mile. In undertaking this work, we recognize that central banks are not the only authorities. They would also need to work with fellow regulatory bodies within their jurisdictions to bring the desired change. We also need, as central banks, to catalyze establishment and implementation of effective middle mile infrastructures or to reform those that exist to support the effective transfer of remittances. At the same time, the private sector should support, should, should collaborate, sorry, in the development of new payment systems and offerings, arrangements, and enhancements to existing services, which will contribute to the improvement that are desired. To achieve progress in a timely manner to meet these targets, the public and private sector will need to engage in plans that will clearly outline actions that will be embarked upon with emphasis on agreed timelines and the monitoring mechanisms so that we are able to track progress and ensure that we indeed achieve progress that is desired. Recognizing the task ahead, I would like to pledge the support and commitment of the SADC Committee of Central Bank Governors Payment System Subcommittee to contribute meaningfully towards the realization of the set objectives and those that will agree in relation to the development in the payment system environment, as this will positively contribute meaningfully to the safety and efficiency of remittance offerings in our region. We indeed look with excitement at the feedback that we're going to be receiving this afternoon relating to the impact that has been made through previous actions, while we should not lose the eye 
on the main objective of continuing to forge forward to ensure that we realize the desired goal to always improve the remittance market in areas where we have the powers to do so. I thank you and thank Finmark Trust for this opportunity to join in this call and look forward to the outcome that we all are due to receive. Thanks, uh, Mr. Program Director uh, Brendan. Thanks very much. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Tim, for that clear input and for also sharing with us uh, what some of your regulatory intentions are coming down the track that is going to open up the space and uh, drive the cost down even more. I think your your emphasis on your your, your emphasis on digitization of the first and last mile certainly resonates with what we as Finmark see as the next frontier to drive prices down further than you know uh, where they are at the moment. Thank you very much, Tim, as usual, a very good partner, and we look forward to working with you and your team as we have over the last uh, 10 years. Um, next on our agenda is the presentation of the results. Um, Damola will present it for us. Damola, you can share your presentation. Thank you very much, Damola. Over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, thank you, Brendan and uh, Tim, for setting the stage for the findings that we're going to be presenting today. The overall objectives, as um, has been spoken to by Brendan and Tim, but um, I think it's also important to just um, say a few words around the reason why we're doing this. Um, we are going to be presenting findings around pricing of remittances. Um, however, it's important to also note that pricing um, as a policy target uh, is meant to enable an expansion of access. So we need to think of the reduction in pricing um, in the the potential that it could lead in terms of expanding access to formal remittances. Um, it's important to, to mention that cross-border remittances uh, enables access to basic services and support business enterprise activities in the, in the SADC region, particularly in the recipient countries, um, which means that uh, cross-border remittances has regional socioeconomic developmental implications. And um, We've already spoken on um, the international agenda around uh, remittances as a developmental goal, uh, and this is embedded in the UN SDG uh, 10.C target uh, to reduce average cost to 3% of transaction cost um, uh, uh, and to eliminate uh, corridors with cost higher than 5%, essentially to increase the disposable income of beneficiaries. And at a regional level, uh, Tim Oz uh, uh, as mentioned that uh, the SADC CCBG payment system subcommittee uh, within the context of the strategic focus areas is also looking to expand usage of formal remittances, uh, obviously through the reduction of pricing, uh, increase in digitization, ensuring that uh, we have uh, appropriate speed of transactions and transparency of product attributes. And uh, from a regional integration perspective, the SADAC Secretariat uh, also um, prioritizes uh, the development of the SADAC remittances market from a regional integration perspective in terms of modernizing and harmonizing of regional payment systems. With that said, um, I want to just uh, mention some key considerations uh, that we need to keep at the back of our minds as I uh, progress in this presentation. So first of all, uh, from a scope perspective, we'll be looking at remittances from South Africa to the rest of SADAC. Uh, South Africa is the economic hub in the region. And um, as Brendan alluded earlier in terms of the history of the region, quite a number of migrants, labor migrants coming into the country um, to work and then 
earn money to send money back home. Uh, the Sadak region, SA to the Sadak uh, corridor, is also the largest corridor in volumes in Africa, as mentioned. So I think that's quite important to put out there. And uh, for us as well, I mean, there's a narrative that the Sadak region has the highest uh, pricing uh, in the world. And uh, from the work that we've been doing over the last 10 years, but particularly in the last three, four years as well, in terms of just refining how we think about, um, you know, the analysis around pricing and how that should be informing policy interventions, we want to sort of put forth uh, a question around an average price for a region um, and, and sort of assess how appropriate that is. And that is something that we'll be dealing with in the panel discussion. I also think it's important to mention that there are some data gaps in what we'll be presenting today. For instance, um, we do not have any information on the financial inclusion level of migrants in SA. We also do not have data on the actual number of migrants sending uh, money from South Africa outbound. Our analysis is strictly based on uh, volumes and values of remittances leaving South Africa. And that data comes specifically from the South African Reserve Bank Financial Surveillance Department. And um, we, we are essentially working with a balance of payments data that covers uh, the categories uh, gifts, migrant worker remittances, and foreign national contract worker remittances. I think Brendan has talked about how this data has improved over time. Um, since uh, 2018, the data is disaggregated by uh, the type of transaction. That is, you can look at issues such as cash versus digital transactions. Um, we can see gender disaggregated data. Uh, and most importantly, um, the data has also been improved to the point where there isn't um, any noise that might come from people using their cards um, in the region for tourism purposes. Um, and the data is pretty much clean uh, uh, from that perspective. So we're quite excited that um, we are working with data that is quite um, uh, rigorous and important. So. Uh, the next slide then kind of gives a perspective on the migrants population, particularly SADC migrants in South Africa. And uh, obviously we're speaking about remittances and this is essentially the baseline information around how to think about, um, you know, potential sizes of the market. Um, it would contextualize the types of volumes and values that we're seeing per corridor. So as you can see, um, from this slide here, um, Zimbabwe is the largest uh, contributor to SADC migrants in South Africa, uh, followed by um, Mozambique. Um, and then if we uh, aggregate Malawi, Lesotho, Mozambique and Zimbabwe, we're looking at about 88.4% of total migrants um, from the SADC region coming to South Africa. Uh, what is also important to mention is that um, about 80, 85 percent percent of these migrants are coming into South Africa to work in low skilled um, jobs. So one could think of them as being in the low income segment and uh, a majority of them, particularly those that are in the low skilled uh, uh, sector, are, are also likely to be undocumented, uh, which would have implications with the types of uh, financial services uh, that they can um, access, particularly if you think about uh, the AML regulation that Tim spoke about from the perspective of commercial banks versus non-banks. And uh, some of the implications of this will be revealed uh, in the subsequent slides. So again, um, to reiterate some of the key events um, uh, over the last decade or so, um, and what characterizes the SA SADA corridor. Um, we know that the banks uh, pretty much dominated um, the scene. And uh, sometime in the mid to the late 90s, there was an introduction of the non-bank licenses, um, Adler 1 specifically. And by 2014, the Adler license categories expanded to three different categories. So you had the one, two, and three. And uh, in 2017, ADLA 4 license was introduced, which specifically uh, relates to goods remittances. That is, people can actually uh, buy or order goods um, 
that can then be um, accessed at retail stores uh, in the uh, recipient countries. Some of the other key uh, uh, events that's happened is the introduction of uh, bank retailer partnerships, particularly in SA Lesotho and SA Eswatini, um, particularly looking at the standard, standard bank uh, ShopRite uh, eccentric uh, service. And I think um, uh, uh, Tim also talked about the FICA amendments in terms of uh, the uh, approval to allow risk-based assessment uh, to onboard uh, customers. Um, and uh, one thing to, to, to be said here from some of our work is that is the non-banks that have implemented this uh, to a much more larger extent than the commercial banks. And most importantly, I think one of the key uh, attributes of our corridors from static outbound is the fact that it's mostly cash based. So um, the fact that post 2014 with um, uh, the advent uh, and the, the, the influx of a lot of Adlers and non-banks who, as we would see in the subsequent slides, are actually driving access to formal remittances. Um, but these Adlers do not have um, the license to keep or provide digital store of value to uh, their clients. So they leverage mostly on the use of agents, uh, which then means that uh, uh, the remittances, a majority of it uh, in the SADAC region is still cash based. And obviously uh, to reduce pricing, uh, the um, introduction or allowing um, Adlers or non-banks to have some sort of digital store value platform could potentially reduce pricing down the line. Now, um, I mean, I've spoke about uh, authorized dealers and authorized dealers with limited authority and for uh, the participants on a call that might not be from our region, uh, this slide just um, uh, um, defines uh, these concepts. And uh, at a very high level, uh, what we're referring to when we talk about authorized dealers, we're talking about banks and the authorized dealers with limited authority are typically non-banks. And as you can see, uh, there are some limitations and, and some attributes to the licensing categories um, uh, on your screen. Now, um, I'm going to then go to a critical issue uh, that kind of precedes uh, uh, the findings in terms of the pricing, and this has to do with the level of formal usage. So we're looking at the flows that have passed through regulated remittances service providers between 2016 and 2021 across the 15 countries uh, that we have. This data comes from the SARB, as I've mentioned earlier. And what is important to notice that is that in the large corridors, the Lesotho, Malawi, Mozambique, um, Zimbabwe, you know, we have very high level uh, of uh, increase from a per percentage change perspective. If you look at the volumes, for instance, in, in Lesotho, this almost 700% increase in Malawi, 300% increase between 2016 and 2021. Malawi, you know, reaching 3 billion rands uh, through formal uh, uh, channels compared to 800 million in 2016. Um, obviously, Zimbabwe being the highest, 6 billion rands compared to 4 billion in 2016. Um, and if we also look at the number of transactions, um, which is actually more telling in terms of the engagement and the level of activity within the corridors, we can see that Eswatini has actually achieved the highest increase uh, between 2016 and 2021 uh, with a percentage uh, north of 13,000 uh, percent. Mozambique has also seen quite a high level uh, of increase uh, over 9,000 percent. And um, same in Tanzania um, and uh, Malawi. And some of the reasons uh, for these uh, uh, very uh, high increases, uh, as we've mentioned earlier, is the introduction of the um, bank retailer model, specifically in Lesotho and Eswatini, the increase in the usage of goods remittances uh, as opposed to pure cash, the increase in the number of service providers in the corridors with the biggest market share, right? And uh, what we've also noticed is that uh, the partnerships that some of the um, non-banks are making with uh, 
uh, uh, potential partners that could facilitate cash out um, or facilitate access uh, for beneficiaries in recipient countries has also had an impact. So partnerships with MNOs, partnership with banks, et cetera, within the region, particularly in the larger corridors, uh, the Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Malawi, Lesotho has been telling and uh, for us as some of uh, the reasons that we believe uh, 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 have resulted in this uh, leap in the usage of formal remittances. And as you can see at a total level, particularly at, at, at a volumes perspective, we've seen an increase of 161% between 2016 and 2021. Now, going to the market share across corridors, which is also quite critical, um, what is important for us to note from a market share perspective is that Zimbabwe, Lesotho, Mozambique, Malawi, and Eswatini corridors uh, make up 96.3% of total volumes, um, and 90.2% of total values. And this is very important uh, for us in terms of how we view uh, the appropriate method of uh, assessing pricing because uh, it would be important to reflect um, these market shares. Um, it's also important to think about the, the larger corridors uh, from the perspective of um, the reduction in pricing because the larger corridors also tend to have uh, the most participation of remittances service providers, which then leads to more competitive pricing, uh, as we would see um, uh, towards the end of this uh, presentation. And what we also pick up is that the corridors with the larger volumes uh, tend to be served by non-banks. Uh, compared to the corridors with lower uh, uh, market uh, uh, sizes, which tend to be served by banks. And again, just reinforcing uh, the, the, the role that non-banks and the, uh, the, the, the increase in market entry and the, 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 the introduction of Adler licenses post 2014, and how that has uh, resulted in uh, an expansion uh, to formal remittances in the region. Um, I've been talking about uh, formal remittances and uh, it's important to also speak to uh, the level of informality. Um, we've tried in the past to assess the level of informality and obviously it's very difficult to assess what's happening in the black market. Um, we did look at this in our previous report, uh, in our 2019 report that looks at SADC remittances, values and volumes. And um, our estimate at the time uh, out of the tw 20 billion uh, rands uh, that was um, uh, transacted uh, between South Africa and the rest of SADC, we estimated that 52% of that was informal. But obviously COVID happened and uh, the borders were closed uh, for considerable uh, a period between March 2020 and October 2020. And uh, one would then expect that um, that would have led to a, a reduction in the level of informality. Um, but obviously, it's also important to note that there are data gaps uh, in assessing the level of informality, which is one of the uh, research uh, uh, endeavors that Finmark hopes to pursue later in this year. But what is also quite important to mention is that there are key, there are some countries, some corridors that have uh, 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 quite large um, estimates uh, for informal remittances, and those could be potential uh, corridors where uh, the frontier could be in terms of expanding um, access to formal uh, remittances, uh, particularly from a product development uh, perspective. DRC comes to mind, and uh, Eswatini also comes to mind in this regard. The next slide speaks to um, some gender perspective around the data that we've looked at. So uh, the line chart that you're looking at here is showing the percentage of outbound remittances in value by women. And uh, what we can see is that um, there has been um, quite an increase, particularly for uh, Mozambique um, and uh, to a lower extent in Zimbabwe and um, a, a much more benign trend for Lesotho and uh, Malawi. But it's important to contextualize this data. 
um, because men are more likely to be the migrant laborers in the region, for instance. Um, so one needs to uh, keep that uh, context at the back of our minds. And um, we also do not have the total number of migrants disaggregated by gender. Uh, if we had that information, uh, it would have been much more telling if we could reconcile the total number of women migrants with um, you know, the values uh, that are uh, accrued to women uh, from a, 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 a outbound remittances perspective. So um, there's also a bit of a data gap there. But definitely um, uh, from a, a purely visual perspective, we can see that particularly in Mozambique, we're seeing more participation in former remittances by women. Now, um, this is an important slide for us to discuss, uh, and this uh, slide looks at the average values. Um, Tim had alluded to this earlier around uh, what uh, constitute uh, the value in which we should be assessing pricing on uh, in the South Africa outbound to the rest of SADC region. And um, as you can see in the table there, um, in countries such as Zimbabwe, Eswatini, Mozambique, Malawi, uh, Lesotho, we're looking at average values uh, that are within the 60, 70 USD um, uh, uh, band. Um, and uh, if we look at the average transaction size for the four big corridors, um, just uh, Lesotho, Malawi, Mozambique, and Zimbabwe, uh, as a matter of fact, that average uh, comes down to 966 South African rands, which is about 66 USD. Um, and if we compare that to 2021, uh, this was 354 USD at the time, um, uh, in 2016 rather. Um, what is also important to kind of mention is that uh, in countries with very high uh, volumes, the corridors with high volumes, we tend to have lower transaction sizes. So um, you can see that uh, in place like Zimbabwe, uh, Malawi, Lesotho and Mozambique uh, have relatively uh, lower average transaction values compared uh, to places like Angola, um, where the uh, the level of uh, volumes uh, is much more lower, and you can see that they have higher uh, average transaction sizes. Uh, what we also know is that uh, the countries with the lower uh, average transaction sizes tend to be served mostly by non-banks as well, while the countries with the higher average transaction sizes are mostly served by banks. Um, and it's also important to state that um, the general reduction in the average transaction size is indicative of the fact that uh, uh, formal remittances has been expanded to uh, the lower income migrants. And we're seeing that uh, um, the policy and interventions around the development of cross-border remittances, remittances in the region is driving regional financial inclusion at the sender end in South Africa and potentially at the recipient end as well. What is also important to show, and, and I've alluded to this, is the uh, disparity between the average transaction sizes between the, the banks and the non-banks. Uh, and as you can see, the table on your screen also reflects this. Um, for 2020, for instance, you can see that for uh, non-banks, uh, for non-CMA countries, uh, CMA being the common monetary area, which includes SA, Eswatini, Lesotho, and Namibia, uh, the average transaction size was 941. Uh, for non-CMA countries where there aren't any forex uh, costs, uh, it's just uh, direct uh, costs uh, incurred, um, that 941 rand uh, compares uh, to of quite uh, very high transaction uh, uh, average sizes uh, from a commercial bank's perspective, which is almost 10,000 rands. And this is a bit telling because it also says that uh, it's not the low income migrant that is used in banks uh, as opposed to in the non-banks where you find more of the low skilled, low income uh, migrants using uh, formal remittance platforms. 
Now, to get to uh, the actual uh, findings from our pricing uh, assessment. So from a method methodological perspective, uh, we conducted a mystery shopping exercise, uh, making payments uh, across um, authorized dealers, banks, and non-banks, the Adlers. Um, we selected uh, the USD55 transaction size to be slightly more conservative, so slightly lower than uh, the 66 USD that um, was ac the actual average that we um, uh, 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 came up with in our analysis so that we can uh, uh, capture more of the lower end of the market, the financial inclusion end of the market, so to speak. Uh, we've also presented the findings from a 200 USD perspective so that we have some sort of uh, comparability with uh, what the World Bank pricing database looks like. Uh, most importantly, We've weighted our pricing by the volumes across license categories. So, for instance, if uh, the volumes in uh, a non-bank category um, is more than the volumes in the bank category, uh, our pricing assessment is weighted to reflect the market share. Uh, so that would be at a corridor level. And then at the regional level, what we do is we weight the pricing by the volumes across countries. So, for instance, um, the pricing uh, for a Zimbabwe, we carry more weight because Zimbabwe has uh, the highest uh, of volumes uh, transacted uh, from SA outbound. And uh, quite important to also mention outside of the CMA, uh, the uh, the total remittances pricing uh, is comprised of direct transaction fees and exchange rate margins. So now to show some of the um, mystery shopping plan that was conducted, this slide kind of gives a perspective on the institutions that we looked at and the countries that were covered. Uh, as you can see there, uh, we conducted 183 uh, transactions to, to pull out um, receipts where we can actually visual you know visibly see the actual um uh, uh costing uh and the costing breakdown uh it's important to note that um uh we had mixed uh, uh experiences in terms of the experience from doing the mystery shopping itself um we found that within the banking uh, uh, uh space um we found that there were costs that were accrued to even the recipient uh which we could not uh, ascertain. Uh, we also found that there were costs that were accrued months after uh, the payment was actually made. So it's, in some corridors, it's quite difficult to kind of uh, get a sense of what the total cost from a banking perspective uh, is, but the costing from a non-bank perspective is much more straightforward um, from our experience, and it was important to kind of note that. Um, as before I, I actually show the, the slides on, on the pricing itself, I think it's important to also sort of mention some of the, the key consideration around pricing. So as I've mentioned, uh, pricing tends to be cheaper through non-banks in the corridors that make up over 90% of the volumes. Uh, the large corridors tend to have more service providers uh, result, resulting in competitive pricing. Um, the larger corridors are also dominated by non-banks uh, as opposed to banks. Mm -hmm. The CMA countries have the lowest pricing um, because there aren't any forex costs incurred. And uh, most importantly, uh, the overall average price for SADC, uh, because of the fact that uh, there would be an overestimate uh, if we just look at a pure arithmetic uh, average, uh, we've looked at uh, the appropriate weightings in this regard. So now, this is the moment um, uh, 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 that we're waiting for. Um, and just maybe prior to that, this slide just kind of gives a sense on the basis of the weightings. So if you look at a, a country like Mozambique, for instance, you can already see that uh, in the Mozambique corridor, it's the non-banks that uh, dominate. You can see Adler category two, 25%, Adler category Category four is 69 percent compared to only four percent for the banks. Uh, in Zimbabwe, it's only 3.2 percent for the banks. While you see very high uh, 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 use uh, or a proportion uh, from a volumes perspective of non-banks. Same thing in Malawi. 
uh, and same thing in uh, Lesotho and Eswatini, um, as you can see on your screens there, uh, and same thing in Mozambique. Um, so now to the pricing, a um, little drum roll. Uh, so this is what we found. Um, this is reflecting the uh, 55 USD um, transaction size. Um, and what we've looked at is to also provide the cost uh, from a licensing category perspective. And if you look at countries outside of the CMA, um, uh, uh, or even generally speaking, the bank cost is the most expensive and um, the non-banks are typically cheaper. But comparing our weighted pricing between 2021 and 2019, um, when we last conducted this exercise, and we used a similar methodology, which actually allows for this compar uh, comparison, because we did do this work in 2017 as well, but we weren't using uh, the same uh, methodology. But comparing apples to apples, we can see uh, the countries where the pricing has dropped, and this is a majority of the countries uh, or corridors in the region. Um, and what we're showing here, uh, essentially, we can see that uh, pricing is dropping, generally speaking. Pricing is increasing uh, in, in two countries, uh, Madagascar and Botswana. Uh, in Botswana, this could be potentially issues around FATF gray list uh, issues. Um, Madagascar, uh, we're not so clear around uh, the, the factors around the uh, high pricing, but uh, this is obviously uh, also probably due to the level of competition. Uh, in the CMA countries, particularly uh, Eswatini, Lesotho and Namibia, we can see that the UN uh, targets has been met uh, from a corridor perspective. So essentially, uh, this is what we're seeing uh, from our pricing um, at a corridor level. But it's very important for me to mention something that, uh, um, yeah, it's all well and fine that we look at uh, uh, a weighted pricing, but what is actually quite important is the cheapest um, uh, uh, service or the cheapest uh, service that people uh, have uh, access to as well. So the cheapest service that most people have access to would also be a, a, a very important component of this discussion. So as you can see in a place like Eswatini um, uh, um, or a place like Malawi, even though the weighted price is 9%, but we have a 6.5% uh, a cost for the Adler 3 uh, 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 component, for instance. So that is important to point to, to, to note. So now going to the 200 USD uh, view, uh, very similar to the 55 USD, but obviously the pricing are much more lower because as the transaction uh, size increases, one expects uh, lower costing. And again, uh, generally speaking, we're seeing a decline in costs. Um, we're seeing increases in a couple of countries, again, Madagascar coming in there. And, but this time, from a 200 USD perspective, it's uh, Tanzania that's increasing. And obviously, again, in the um, CMA countries, uh, we're seeing that the uh, uh, UN and G20 targets have been met. And now, at a regional level, I think what is important here, I'm going to be showing three slides that provide a regional uh, 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 view around uh, pricing. What we're going to show is the unweighted pricing, which is how pricing typically is calculated um, uh, if we kind of uh, view what other development partners are doing. Uh, we are aware that uh, the World Bank uses the SMART average, and it will be interesting to hear uh, this uh, uh, in more detail during the panel discussion. But from an uh, unweighted average perspective, um, this is uh, the view on your screen. Um, again, the CMA countries are already uh, within uh, the UN targets. The big four corridors, Lesotho, Malawi, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, fastly approaching the 5% uh, target. Um, from a SADC total perspective, still pretty high, 20%. And uh, SADC total, um, um, including the CMA, 15%. Um, the pricing are much more lower if we look at the USD 200 
7.3 for SADAC total, 9.5 for SADAC total excluding CMA, 1.2 uh, for uh, CMA only, and 6.3 for the four biggest corridors that make up over 90% of the volumes. The next slide here is looking at the weighted pricing. And if we look at the weighted pricing, as you can see, um, you know, compared to the last slide, the SADAC total weighted price is now 9.6 for the 55 USD and it's 7.2 uh, for the 200, um, excluding the CMA is 10.2 and it's 7.6, um, comparing 2021 and uh, uh, for the two, um, uh, transaction size uh, that we're looking at. Um, for the uh, four big corridors, we're looking at 8.5 for the USD 55 and 7% uh, for 200 USD, which essentially is also showing reduction um, overall from a regional perspective. And we're seeing that the pricing is also approaching the 5% um, ceiling that has been uh, um, identified by the UN. The um, last slide, uh, in terms of what we would like to propose, and, and I've alluded to this uh, earlier, is the idea that we need to perhaps think about uh, average remittances by considering access, uh, um, uh, and not just looking at pricing uh, at face value, but considering the price that the majority of uh, the remitters uh, receive when they uh, make transactions. And this that is what we've tried to do on this slide. We've tried to um, show the price that the largest group of remitters receive. And we've come up with a term for it, the modal price, if you like. And we're hoping that this could also spark some debate. Um, obviously, this is not done at a regional level, but more at a corridor level. But you can see that um, in our large corridors, Places like Mozambique, uh, Zimbabwe, Malawi, Lesotho, Eswatini, um, the uh, modal price uh, are also pretty coming down and quite low. Um, and, and, and this is quite encouraging, but uh, we believe uh, there is a debate to be had uh, around um, sort of merging the ideas of access and pricing together. And in conclusion, before we get to the panel, um, we uh, would like to speak around uh, the potential aspects in, in reducing pricing um, in terms of uh, pricing in the region. We believe that uh, uh, the provision of a digital store of value to non-banks, that is to have uh, non-banks, Adlers, have um, some sort of savings platform that allows uh, senders to remit directly from their phones without finding an agent or carrying cash uh, could potentially reduce pricing. We believe that uh, the introduction of mobile money service from SA outbound will reduce pricing. Um, and uh, we believe that the digitization of the last mile um, in the beneficiary countries uh, would also reduce um, the pricing. And uh, obviously the wider implementation of the SADAC transactions cleared on immediate basis scheme. Um, another uh, aspect of our concluding thoughts here before we move into the panel discussion is the need to address the non-transparent billing structure uh, used by uh, regional banks uh, that we found in our uh, mystery shopping. And obviously this will be taken up with uh, the regulators um, after this presentation. And uh, one of the key issues here as well is how uh, we need to achieve consensus on how pricing is assessed. We do understand that there are different incentives around the pricing, you know, in terms of standardization and in terms of being able to compare countries. But um, we do know that there are idiosyncrasies around uh, 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 um, uh, regional comparisons uh, and things of that nature. So we need to kind of uh, address uh, this pricing uh, assessment and its methodology so that uh, we ensure that the appropriate uh, market interventions and uh, 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 are coming into play. And uh, finally, uh, we believe that we should be addressing some of the data gaps, which speaks directly uh, to the number of migrants in South Africa in terms of gender, level of financial inclusion, and remittances behavior. And uh, with that, uh, that brings me to the end uh, of uh, my presentation. 
uh, next will be um, the panel discussion. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kamala. You raised a number of key issues <clears throat> and as well as pointed to what still needs to be done. I think we've made impact. I think you'll agree with me that the numbers are heading in the right direction um, and that they need to continue along that uh, trajectory. We do, I see a few questions in the chat. Uh, um, my colleagues will be attending to those uh, soon so that you'll have some answers. But I think we need to move on to the discussion, the panel discussion. Uh, Tula Sizwe, I think you are ready to take over and introduce your panel and uh, give us some, some further insights. Brendan, thank you. Uh, and Ramola, thank you for that um, extensive and highly informative uh, presentation. Uh, it's eye-opening. It's almost like, you know, when they say the scales are falling off, um, even as I listen to you, a whole other conversation that one would possibly have missed uh, in our day-to-day -day activities. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure for me to be amongst you uh, for this uh, discussion around remittances in the SADC region. Well, where do we start? For me, I think perhaps, you know, I was thinking about this issue that we're discussing and I started thinking about, um, and I'm not gonna be a speaker. I will avoid the temptation to be a speaker. But very briefly, I was thinking about the song that, you know, the late Hugh Masigela sang, the classic that says Stimela. In the opening stanza of that song, Hugh Masigela tells us, there's a train that comes from Namibia and Malawi. There's a train that comes from Zambia and Zimbabwe. There's a train that comes from Angola and Mozambique, from Lesotho, from Botswana, from Swaziland, from all the hinterlands of Southern Africa and Central Africa. And he talks about how this train brings young men. At the time, the conversation was about conscription to come and work uh, on contract in the gold and mineral mines of Johannesburg. Of course, there are more dynamics now. The, the sectors are more varied and the modes of travel, I imagine, are also more varied than you know, the typical train, but you know, it sums up the story. And we're also talking about this in the context of regional integration and continental integration, and one that is geared more towards intracontinental trade as well as the ease of movement of people. And I suppose that for me, helped me to frame this conversation. And as I say, over the past century or so, it's not just the trains that crisscross the hinterlands of our region, but in my mind, when people travel, they arguably carry with them the hopes that they have of a better life. And those are lodged firmly in their bosoms as they travel across countries. So if they come here physically by plane, train, or automobile, as the expression goes, I suppose a key pathway of transit for the hopes that they harbor coming into South Africa for economic upliftment um, that they hold in their hearts, that pathway of travel for those hopes is arguably the cross-border remittances and transfers that we are talking about uh, at the moment. And through these transfers, I've made the example of using a typical name, I suppose, uh, in Zimbabwe. Let's call this person Tariro. Tariro would be able to send a thousand rand, which would be about $68 to her mother in a village somewhere in Nyamapanda in Zimbabwe, for her to be able to buy fertilizer, which she then would be able to use uh, for crop farming for the produce that she would then go on to sell at the local market. Of course, the example had to be Zimbabwean because I've been a, mig a migrant labor myself, a laborer uh, myself, and there was uh, the, the country where I was, a, a laborer, migrant laborer, also sending um, uh, remittances back to South Africa for a period of about three years. So the way I look at that for me, and this is one example uh, that can be replicated across all the regions that Damola has been uh, talking about in the last while, it's the symbiosis and the potential for migration when we harness it and we view it as an opportunity than rather, rather than as a burden, as tends to happen from time to time. But from the work that Damola has just shared with us and the work done by FMT, and it's clear that the potential 
of these remittances and uh, transfers is possibly far greater than we've currently realized. And a key factor in why you know, it's perhaps not fully uh, unleashed, it has to do, I suppose, with the costs involved in the transfers uh, that are involved. So in that context, there are two questions that I think Damola's presentation leaves us with and challenges us towards. And the key one, the first one being about initiatives to reduce the costs of remittances, specifically in the SADC region. But also a second question has to do with the merits or demerits of using average pricing uh, to assess costs of remittances, uh, as opposed to what Damola was talking about, which he says is the modal um, model of, uh, um, of assessing the costs. So let me briefly, briefly introduce the panel that will be talking to these questions. Uh, fortunately, it won't be me. I won't uh, be answering those uh, deep uh, questions. Firstly, let me introduce Harish Natarajan from the World Bank. Harish is the lead financial sector specialist on payments and market infrastructures in the finance, competitiveness, and innovation global practice. So, you know, looking up his uh, bio, Harish uh, represents the World Bank in the working groups of the Committee on Payment Market Infrastructures at the Bank uh, for International Settlements and FinTech-related working groups at the Financial Stability Board. His background is in that kind of work that has to do with transfers, having worked uh, with Visa before joining um, the World Bank uh, visa in South Asia. The next person I'm going to introduce is advocate Mahedi Titus Topwan from the South African Reserve Bank. He's a senior manager there um, and also an advocate, of course, of the High Court uh, of South Africa. He's senior manager in the National Payment Systems uh, Department of the Reserve Bank and talks his work talks to uh, the RTGS uh, systems and the renewal program uh, thereof. Nicholas Vontron uh, is the CEO of uh, Mama Money. And basically Mama Money is uh, said to be the world's first social business money transfer operator. So um, Nicholas is at the cold face of the conversation that we are having. And I liked when I looked at his bio there that he mentions in explaining why it's called Mama Money that you know, people ask why it's called Mama Money. And he says, well, firstly, a lot of people send money to their mama. So <laughs> that's quite apt that it would be nam named in that way. The last uh, panelist I'm going to introduce is Nikki Kettles uh, from Finmark Trust, uh, who is executive head of programs at Finmark Trust, uh, who have been doing this work for the past 20 years, while well, varied works, uh, work that has to do with making uh, financial solutions work uh, for the poor um, and, and also financial inclusion for various categories of people. So I think let's start um, with the first question then, uh, which comes from Damola's presentation. What initiatives are there uh, or can be improvised to reduce the cost of remittances, if we are to argue that remittances, the costs thereof, perhaps hinders uh, the realization of the full potential of inter-country remittances. And I suppose, let me start, um, I don't know, I, any of these panelists could really take this, but I think let me start with you, Advocate Mahedi uh, Titus Tokwan. What, what's your initial thinking, firstly, around what has been presented by uh, Damola, and then talk to the first question about, you know, what initiatives are there that can be harnessed to reduce uh, some of these costs? Uh, good, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, all protocol observed. Um, in, in my view, um, I think um, when you look at the results that have been uh, presented by the colleagues from uh, Finmark Trust, they are encouraging. Um, when you look at the, um, the they call the LMM, I think it's L LMMZ, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, corridors, but um, specifically the focusing on the Eswatini and um, Lesotho corridors. If you look at the interventions 
that um, uh, have been undertaken in that uh, corridor. They have uh, demonstrated that um, uh, if you um, implement um, the, the regulatory reforms that enabled your non-banks such as uh, ShopRite to provide that uh, type of service in the, that um, uh, typical corridor, you will drastically reduce your your prices and then you will drive up the, the volumes of transactions um, in that um, uh, corridor. It would have been uh, encouraging if we see that uh, type of interventions in the other uh, corridors where uh, you don't have the, the services of um, non-banks. Now, from the uh, central bank point of view, as the the operator of the of the system and what we we uh, observe and what we deal with, um, one of the initiatives I think uh, uh, my colleague Damula has touched on it is the introduction of a um, wider adoption of uh, the middle mile infrastructure called um, a TCIB. This is a middle mile infrastructure that was. Um, uh, guided by uh, the SADC Payment System uh, 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 Committee, and it was implemented uh, with a private and public partnership with Bank Safe Africa and Banking Association. So that infrastructure would, in my view, unlock um, a wider um, access. In other words, uh, it will provide the operators of the uh, or service providers from the first mile infrastructure to the last uh, mile infrastructures and uh, connections into the broader um, low value um, uh, cross border transacting in SADC. In layman terms, what do I mean? Uh, it means that uh, you, if you have a person that wants to send money across border, that person will have a wider choice of um, service providers on the sending side and a wider uh, service providers on the receiving side, um, as opposed to where you would have a, a, what we call a closed loop system. In other words, you utilize one service provider on the sending side and on the receiving side. I think uh, I will pause here and then give my uh, colleagues an opportunity to maybe expand on other initiatives that they, they might um, uh, think of. Thank you. Thank you, Advocate uh, Tokwane. Let me bring in Harish Natarajan. Um, Harish, um, I suppose it's good morning on your side. Um, from what I heard, you're in the United States. Um, thank you. So just your overall impressions of this conversation and, and, and the presentation just concluded by Damola. And, and then um, you can also then go on to tackle the first question, which has to do with, you know, initiatives that can assist in driving down the costs. Uh, thank you, uh, Sula. This is where uh, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. You pronounce my name uh, perfectly well, but I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing it correctly. And as um, uh, Mahidi mentioned, uh, all protocols observed. Let me also congratulate the, the FMT team for uh, an excellent analysis. And I think um, research uh, like this always uh, provides fresh insights and, uh, and provides more timely inputs to, uh, to authorities. I think um, the, there were a number of uh, kind of um, points raised in the, in the discussion. I think one of the big one was it related to the amounts and, and averages. So I think that will be perhaps best addressed as part of the second discussion. Uh, so let me get to the let me get to this point related to initiatives which which could support. And I think um, Damola in his intervention already alluded to some of them in his concluding slide, and we fully agree with that. But perhaps just to put some structure around it, I think um, the remittances agenda has several dimensions. There's a global dimension, there's a regional dimension, and then there's a country level uh, dimension. And the World Bank as an institution, um, kind of a, a, a kind of a global institution, a member-owned cooperative of governments. I think we play on all three levels. Um, at the global level, our role is more on advocacy, building in more support at the sending country levels um, for for the remittances agenda, and just uh, providing some of the monitoring tools and, uh, and developing some guidelines, principles, and frameworks, uh, which can serve as uh, reference points for country authorities. 
at the regional level, our work is with institutions like um, uh, the, the SADC um, uh, Payments uh, Association. We have a long um, the history of collaboration with, with Tim and his team uh, and his uh, predecessors. And uh, we are also happy to be supporting the middle mile infrastructure of TCIB, which is, which is currently coming up. Uh, and I think at the regional level, uh, we or sub-regional level, uh, perhaps uh, uh, be the right term, uh, we have, um, in the SADC region, we have assessed the remittances market using the uh, general principles for international remittances, which was jointly developed by the CPMI and the World Bank uh, in, in, uh, in almost all the countries. And the, and the findings have been consolidated uh, and the key, uh, key issues are being discussed at the sub-regional level to build momentum. Um, uh, and then also the kind of um, knowledge exchange and sharing. So we facilitate all of that. And at the country level, I think this uh, this dimension often gets missed. And of course, um, um, Double in his uh, in his um, this guy in his uh, presentation did talk about the regulatory side of it in terms of regulatory reforms to allow entry of new players. But I think there's also an important dimension of improving the domestic uh, payment infrastructure, which has a, a very strong link with remittance prices as well. And we are supporting uh, the development of remit domestic um, payment systems in many countries. Uh, South Africa, for example, is currently developing uh, a new generation of fast payment services. Um, and uh, there are similar efforts which the World Bank is supporting in countries like Mozambique and Madagascar. And there are other development partners who are supporting it in Tanzania. And what that does is you have fast payment systems on both sides. Uh, their different service products can get connected, improve the middle mile infrastructure, and you could have an end-to-end -end fast, transparent, uh, a regulated um, and, and, and lower cost uh, financial service. So I think the domestic infrastructure component, in addition to the regulatory reforms, I think is an important point. Then I will, uh, I will one additional point I think to mention is also on the foreign exchange margins. Uh, remittances broadly, if you look at the cost, there are three elements, three different buckets of cost, the cost on the sending side, the cost related to the transfer, a big part of it is, uh, is foreign exchange, and on the, risk, the cost on the receiving side. The cost on the sending and receiving side to a large extent can be reduced by looking at more technological options, by removing the need for agents, uh, using digital channels for sending and receiving. But the middle cost uh, of the middle level, uh, which, which basically involves the um, a third party to come in between and allow the exchange, uh, and foreign exchange fees are a very big component of that. And globally, we see that as being very sticky um, across, across the years. And in, in some corridors in SADC, I think it is significantly higher than the typical average of between 2.5 to 3 percent. I think in some of the corridors in uh, in SADC, we see like rates of around 5 percent for the foreign exchange fees. Uh, and this goes to this, I think, is to some extent perhaps a reflection of also the uh, the structure of the market in terms of your trading between currencies, which are not necessarily uh, very widely traded in the in the foreign exchange markets. You might have to go through the USD which might add, add some additional cost. So I think there are some structural issues there. And I think in addition to all the things we discussed, I think some interventions are perhaps required there. Uh, let me conclude by noting that the G20, um, uh, the, the global level, came up with a, a roadmap for cross-border payments. And they identified a number of um, uh, you know, a number of uh, reform, uh, uh, reform topics that uh, are organized into nine building blocks. I think all of them are equally relevant uh, also in the, in the SADC region. Thank you. Thank you for that, um, Mr. Natarajan, and you do pronounce my name uh, uh, perfectly. Um, one of the themes I'm picking up then uh, very early on in the conversation has to do with the issue of uh, regulatory reform. Um, and I think um, Advocate Togwane raised it as well, and you've also raised it. Um, so that's one of the early trends I'm starting to pick up, uh, but also around the issue of uh, infrastructure. And interestingly, you're raising the issue of the middle mile because we've been talking a lot about the first and the last mile. Um, Nikki, I will come to you next, uh, but I think let me bring in um, uh, Nicolas uh, Vontron uh, into this conversation. Please, uh, uh, I apologize if I don't uh, uh, pronounce your name correctly. If we are having this conversation about volumes having increased by about 161%, between 2016 and 2021, and value of these transfers having gone up by 106%. A lot of people, um, to use your explanation, your part explanation of the name in your company, a lot of people are sending money to their mamas. Um, just what is your impression of what this new data 
uh, this data that has been collated by FMT. Um, what's your reading of the picture that it paints for you, as well as the question of what are the mechanisms, what are the levers that we can pull uh, to try and, and bring down the cost? Cool. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks a lot for inviting me. I'm going to try to, to speak a bit on behalf of the industry because I see I'm the only, I'm the only person from the private sector. So I'm going to try to put my money aside for a, for a few minutes. Um, although I just want to say something is we want to be at the for, forefront of price reduction. I know it's part of our strategy as a, as a social business. There's more work that, that can be achieved there, obviously, but like it's something that we take very seriously. And I just wanted to thank massively Damola for that analysis because it was always very frustrating for me to see like averages being shown and actually they really are not aligned to, to, the, to the, what the market is charging. So we're getting to something which is more relevant. So thank you very much for helping there and, and showing a bit something which is more accurate um, and really well done on that. Um, so what, what, is the, um, that, what, what is that data saying to me? There's, there's two main things there. There is one which is about the size of the market, which is growing. Um, and this, I want to go back to customers and why this is happening. Um, I mean, migrations are a fact, you know, they are accelerating and, and some countries are richer than others. And some people are, are trying their luck somewhere else when they, when they are in shock or when there's like economic uh, distress or when there's war. I mean, right now, obviously there's a, a new war happening and, and you can see the impact on migrations in Ukraine. Right? So, so um, I think that's one of the reasons why I think these folks have, have raised is that migrations are accelerating. And you know, like the, the, the World Bank actually is saying by 2050, there will be an additional 150 million migrants um, over the world, 80%, oh, sorry, 60% coming from Africa. Um, so so that's, that's a reality and, and we can't really avoid it. I don't want to state any political message here, but obviously, <laughs> you know, it's something that we have, we have to welcome and we have to work with. Um, um, and to a certain extent, borders are, are in our minds. Eh? Uh, so I think that's one of the reasons why you, you see these this flows growing is because, because migrations have accelerated. But the second reason, which is also super important, is actually there's a lot of conversion from informal flows to formal flows. Um, and right now we're only measuring formal flows in, in that data, right? But if we were to measure the informal flows, the, the, the overall flows have grown, but also there's more and more um, formal players who, who are supporting these remittances instead of informal flows. Which actually is going to lead to my first point around, around, um, around what, what can be done to, to reduce price further and, and to accelerate a little bit that, that trend. I think there's a big um, challenge for, for us, I would say as an industry, uh, with the informal market. Because you, you can't really see in the informal market, there, there's two types of informal market. Right? There's an informal market which is using informal channels, um, i.e. I, I give money to the bus driver, they, you know, they drive back to the country and they give money back or like sometime in goods and, and, and all of that, right? But there's also an informal market which is actually very structured in South Africa and, and operating uh, with, like, with like formal systems. Um, and for, for example, for Mozambique, to, to name Mozambique as an example, um, you know, there's a, there are mobile money players in Mozambique which are receiving a lot of remittances and, and we see them operating in South Africa, but like they're illegal. And they do not have to deal with all of the, the challenges that we have as, as for like, re, like regulated players, which is around uh, AML and, and you know, the KYC or the FICA regulation. So you can just go to one of these agents and just give money to, to an agent and there's no KYC, there's nothing, and they just send the money straight away. And to a certain extent, um, they, also, they also manage the currency very differently. So it's a very, very structured and very sophisticated informal market. And because of like being being a formal player and having to invest a lot in compliance and regulatory um, uh, uh, everything which is support um, our regulatory uh, engagement, um, you know that there, there's also like to a certain extent an, um, an unfair competition there. So I would I would think um, one of the initiatives and something I'm calling out for a little bit of support is actually trying to see what can be done to to stop the illegal players, because I think they, they also represent a risk for the formal industry, but also just for customers, because see, there's, no, there, there's no consumer protection, there's very little AML or, or non-AML there. So that, that's one thing I think that, that can be done to, to support. And then more volume will go into the formal markets, and then obviously that volume drives the uh, cost down. So that's one big thing I, I wanted to, to share. 
And then the, the other ones is, is actually things I think that you guys have shared, which there are there are three or four, four main challenges that we're facing. One of them is due to value chain. I mean, you, you talked about it, the cash in and the cash out, for instance, you know, part of that value chain that has a cost. Uh, that cost needs to be included in price. We would love to decrease that that price more, but like you know, sometimes you have to to share with your value chain several percentage because of the cash in and the cash out cost. Um, there's also agents that we need to we need to, to to pay because there's a there's challenges around uh, financial literacy and literacy overall in certain corridors, and so you need a human contact to be able to talk to the customer, and that is also a cost. So so like any type of financial literacy initiatives will help as well. Um, there's obviously everything which is around KYC and documentation that I, that I talked about. And then um, the last one, um, talking uh, like maybe iterating on what uh, Mr. Natarajan has said around currency, um, you know, the specifically to South Africa here, which is something, for instance, you can't see from the US or from Europe, but the, the, the RAND is not a very stable currency. Um, it's a very volatile currency, and it's, it's something which is linked to the way that the markets, the international markets, are structured. And so, if you, if you look at the at the rand value versus the dollar over the last few years, and actually you look at the the, the average transaction value, the non-CMA average transaction value, which has which has reduced, I think this is a direct impact of the rand value versus the dollar because the rand has depreciated over the last five years. So you can you can see that straight away from the transaction value. Um, but but on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, the run fluctuates a lot, right? And 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 this fluctuation because of the the payment infrastructure and the type of of um, of uh, trading that you can do, you need to factor that into your price, that risk. And it is it is a significant risk over over a few days, the run can depreciate or appreciate by by a few percent. Um, so this is also another challenge that we're facing. Fantastic. Thank you for that uh, for that input, uh, Nicholas. Um, Nikki, let me bring you in here. Uh, you've been listening and hearing uh, the inputs from our panelists in response to the work uh, that you and the team have done uh, at FMT. How does that square up with your own thinking um, around, you know, how do we address um, these these uh, these costs? Where you know, if we're saying that the ideal in terms of the SDGs is about 5% in terms of the costs. And we're looking at the SADC total um, on that, you know, 55 US dollar um, mystery shopping that you undertook um, that came down for the SADC total at about 15%. It's quite a, a far cry from, you know, the ideal of under 5%, but you've been hearing uh, the other panelists talking I've had regulatory reform quite a bit but I've also just heard now from Nicholas around um, regulation of the uh, informal and, in his words, the illegal players as well. Take all of that in and just let me know what's your initial thinking. Uh, and thank you. Thank you very much to the panelists. And, and I think you've hit on, on all of the soft spots that, that we debate constantly. Um, so when we started on the journey um, and working in the environment of cross-border remittances, it was about those most vulnerable. It was about the lowest sort of denominators, the $55. Um, dollars. Um, and the, the approach was really about trying to understand the corridors, understand the blockages, work on regulatory reform, which was the introduction of the Adlers, um, when risk-based was introduced into the country, we were very concerned that a lot of the FSPs would de-risk, um, and we developed a framework to support um, onboarding of, of migrants for low-value cross-border remittances and bank accounts. Um, in that instance, for example, the regulatory reform happened, but we've subsequently um, done some research, and we're finding that not everybody is implementing risk-based onboarding, CDD, as well as management of their customers, which is a blockage. It still is a blockage because if that was done appropriately, we think that there, there could be some sort of price break. Um, and to support that, we are, and I think it confirms everything that Titus and Harish and Nick said, um, we, we are looking at the bottom-up approach and trying to understand and 
we'll be implementing two pilots. Um, and the one is to try and assess the value of cross-border digital KYC. So if I am in South Africa and I would like to send a remittance formally to my family member in Lesotho, the time and energy and stress to become KYC'd is sometimes just bigger than, than you know, wanting to send it formally and people will be pushed into informality. So we're busy testing at the moment how we can use those databases as pinging them to onboard um, residents of SADC into this, this environment of, of um, formal cross-border remittances. I mean, the, the, the challenge with informality is that often people are driven to informality because it is more convenient. That being said, we've seen that informality has reduced to around 50%. So it's getting better, but it isn't where it should be. And there's a whole lot of other reasons um, that we need to look at. The other one um, which has been mentioned is that first mile challenge, which does link to informality, but it also links to where the costs are. Because as Titus said, TSIP is trying to address the middle mile. Um, we have RPP, which is trying to address instant payment and sorting out the domestic payment situation. The challenge, of course, as we know, if you look at the FinScope data, is that the number of bank accounts that are swept within 24 hours and people move into the cash environment is really, really tough and sad. So we can't just build it and expect them to come. There's going to have to be some changes in the process. I mean, I know when I first started at Finmark Trust, I was surprised at some research that said um, individuals that had bank accounts on either side of the transaction still went, withdrew all their money, walked to the retailer, gave the retailer the money to send their money to their mother in KZN, who also had a bank account, but wanted to fetch it from the retailer. You know, so I think that there's bigger issues at play that we, we do need to understand. The other thing that we, we feel quite strongly about is that first mile digitization. Um, and there is a bit of conflict in the regulation that, that we are trying to work with. But if we could enable migrants to get a store of value, which is the next pilot that we are we are in the process of implementing, to try and assess if that will assist in taking those first mile costs out, those cash in costs out, but also it then supports true financial inclusion and then supports a more end to end digital process of sending the remittances. Um, so I'm sort of confirming everything that everyone's saying, but we've taken a very bottom up approach, which has been the Finmark approach to really get onto the ground and to test and to see if it actually does it. I mean, the Forex one, as Harish says, is it's sticky. I mean, our last research says that the average Forex margins in the region are sitting at about 2.3%. Wow, if we could knock off a percent of that already, it starts to, to bring those prices down. But again, with the volatile exchange rate, there are challenges. So in agreement, and, and I think that's the, the process to try and ensure we, we do the bottom up and to test and see how we can make it for those most vulnerable. Thank you. Nikki, thank you for that. Um, I, I don't want us to um, run out of time in terms of the you know questions and engagements from some of the attendees uh, to this to this um, session. So what I will try to do is before we engage substantively with the question of um, the right matrix to use uh, in terms of you know. Uh, the appropriate methodology around the costing of, of remittances, whether it is the um, average pricing or the model um, uh, pricing method that was suggested by Damola. Before we get to that substantive discussion, I think I'll open up. Um, and while I do that, uh, to just check in and check with the team whether there are any questions, uh, comments, contributions that have come through, um, I do want to challenge uh, Nicholas, um, about the issue of convenience. I heard you, Nikki, talking about uh, the convenience that comes from informality. And Nicholas, I'd like to ask you, can that convenience be achieved while at the same time um, driving also the benefits of, of, of the formal operations uh, that you are trying to, uh, to, to, to encourage, as well as driving down the costs? 
the convenience? How do you how how do you address it within your sector? Um, so it's actually a very complex question. Um, if you take so, I don't know how familiar you are with mobile money, um, M-Pesa, MTN money, you know, Orange money. I'm I, I'm I'm going to take two examples. I'm going to take DRC and Mozambique. Um, very like interesting mobile money markets on the receiving side. In Mozambique, for instance, M-Pesa has five or six million active customers. I mean, it's a it's a real success, right? It's the de facto payment system in the country. You all know M-Pesa Kenya or EcoCash in Zimbabwe back back in the days. Um, so as an agent, as an MPSA agent, you operate in, in Mozambique or you operate uh, in DRC, right? And some, and you know, it's like a, you need a, a SIM card and a phone to be able to do that. And then, you know, you take cash and you, you, you top up a wallet. Um, so what's, what's happening is some, some of these um, agents, uh, you know, they're, they're businessmen. Eh? And so what they do, they travel, they, go, they, they come to South Africa and like, oh, there's a large population of migrants as we can see in few macro states, right? And what they do is they, they roam on their SIM card and they are still an MPSA agent or they're still a, like a DRC agent. And what, and what they do, I'm putting very, very simple examples here. It's sometimes a bit more complex. But then what, you know, you'd come to me, I'm an agent, I have an, I'm an MPSA agent, I operate in South Africa. And you come to me, you give me cash, I top up your recipient, but not doing an international money transfer. Doing a domestic transaction, which is which is actually from a roaming sim. So this is typically how sophisticated that is. And to be able to do that, I'm not asking for your KYC at all. I don't I don't care. I just want your cash. So to fight against that in the and in a regulatory framework, what we offer number one, we we're competing on price, obviously. But second, we offer reliability, very very robust quality, very robust customer service. Um, but it, but it's it, it's still tough because you know as a as a some of these migrants, like they, there's a trust uh, challenge already, and then you know you're asking for documentation, and they're worried because oh, uh, what are, what are, what is going to happen to me? What do you want to do with my documents? There is a lot of fear there, so it's easier to go to an informal agent and just give cash, and then they send money across the border. Actually, the money is already in 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 the receiving country. Um, so I don't know if it's answering your question, but essentially it's 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 very hard, you know. I think so to to a certain extent, this is not. This is this this is um, this can be fought through working with the providers, but also I think at regulatory level. Thank you for that, uh, Nicholas. Um, I see that the conversation is uh, already happening uh, in the chat. Um, I'm not sure if there's anyone who is able to assist me with tracking where we are from M FMT. Um, that's able to, that's been tracking what are some of the key points of conversation um, that have come through because I've, yeah I'm seeing just from the time when Damola was still doing the presentation it, it's it's been ongoing so I'm kind of not able to pick up um, any of the points and just highlight it immediately is there someone who's able to just highlight one or two yeah, we've got Brendan who's picking up most of the responses um, and Nicola. Um, and Damola is also sitting in the other room, but I see Harish has got a question, but maybe Brendan can give you some of the keys that have come through. All right, Harish, please go ahead uh, while Brendan um, gets ready to then uh, highlight one or two of the issues coming through from the chat. Right, and I think um, I wanted to just react to your question about um, convenience versus um, regulated services, whether they are contradictory and whether it has kind of achieved the same level of convenience with regulated service providers. I think um, clearly there are there are challenges, but I think our experience shows that in many markets, um, once regulations, so one, once regulated services were allowed uh, and, and, and new models, business models were allowed to enter, there has been adoption of them. So, uh, so it is not that um, the kind of people who are using informal channels would want to continue to use that, even when there are uh, convenience of even even when there are new models and new business services which are being offered in the market. I think it is really a question of raising the level of awareness. Raising the level of um, the kind of uh, uh, kind of, um, uh, kind of, kind of the, the services which they, which the market can offer, giving a more uh, creating a more conducive environment for that, and I think um, there are risks associated with informal as well to the to the centers, right? And I think uh, if there's uh, if you raise the awareness of that, I think there is um, uh, there would be a movement towards 
uh, more convenient um, regulated services if the services are offered right at the right price point at the at the right level of um, uh, kind of taking into account the context of the end user and so on, right? So I, I think that is not. Uh, I think one needs to challenge ourselves. You know, kind of we we should not compromise convenience. Um, uh, kind of we should not treat them as trade offs. I think we should try to achieve both. Thank you. All right, thank you for that, Brendan. I'm not sure if you and the team on that side have anything that you want you'd want to uh, lift up uh, from the from the chat. Yes, there's a, I've been working overtime responding to all of these questions. My colleagues seem to have deserted me. Um, but just to go through some of them very quickly, uh, the one was on the issue the, on the gender slides around women. Um, given that <clears throat> initially the mining sector was mostly, in fact, it was regulated that only men could come across to to work in the mines. But subsequently to that, there you know migrants work in many different industries, including. Uh, domestic workers, and certainly that's coming through in the data. If you look at Mozambique, the sharp uh, um, increase of women that are uh, migrants, you know, is coming through. So that's that's uh, one of the points. Um, the next one was around. It it seems that there are limits, and 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 this comes from the previous regime, I think, which is a bit of a hangover. Um, the regulations which which restricted migrants uh, in their remittances to remit. Uh, under 3,000 rand per transaction, and I think it was 10,000 rand per month. Um, so the question comes through as to whether that's still the case or whether it's going to be revised. My response to that was the risk-based approach removes all of these rules and gets the, the financial institution to set its own risk limits on the basis of its risk analysis. So the regulators on the risk-based approach don't tell you what limits to put. You need to assess what risk you know, the ease in your clients and then set those risks. But as you say, a number of these comments relate to the fact that the risk-based approach has not been implemented properly in South Africa yet. In fact, it's been implemented more in the non-bank space than in the bank space. The banks, the conservatism uh, and the risk averseness of the banks, you know, is coming through, uh, you know, in this. And the recent study that we did actually showed this. Uh, a comment from Radu, and I understand he comes from Madagascar. He works at the SADC Secretariat. He's looking at the big differences between sending to uh, Madagascar between $55 and $200. Both of them are very high. And the response there is that the volumes are very low to Madagascar. Uh, and it's a commercial issue around the lack of competition, you know, in that market because the volumes are so low. And it's an, you know, it's a problem, you, you know, that we need to deal with. But a lot of this pricing is driven by that. So you'll see in the corridors where where the where the most traffic goes, the prices are lower there, and and there are more products in that market, and there's more innovation. So that answers that. Um, there's questions about FATF, and again, they they relate to the risk-based approach. Um, FATF, the fact the, the um, one of the questions was about whether. The FATF regulations are resulting in lower pricing. Uh, at the moment, we, we are not seeing that come through. What we are seeing is that um, the FATF regulations are leading to more people being included in the formal sector. So those who, uh, when the AML levels were set too high, they haven't, they, they weren't able to be to 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 use the formal services. Now that the risk-based approach is in, some of the Adlers have moved quite well, and they're including more people. We still have to see that coming through in the in, in the pricing. Um, uh, I'm not sure whether our 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 guest from Mama Money will be able to tell us, you know, whether that is there at all. Um, yeah, I think there were some more technical points raised, uh, uh, interesting points raised about the CMA. The CMA yeah. pricing, if you look at if you look at the pricing, is the lowest, including in fact. It's the banks that are providing the lowest uh, pricing, and that's because of the CMA, because the currencies are pegged, um, uh, so there's no foreign exchange cost there. But as well, uh, those transactions and and um, Mahedi, you need to help me. Uh, those transactions were treated as domestic transactions, so there were no reporting requirements and all of that, and that's why. And so maybe the CMA, which is a bit of an outlier, um, provides the permanent solution to reducing the cost of cross-border remittances to 1.8%. But that means you'll have to have a common currency in SADC. And, and uh, I'm not sure we want to talk about that in this, <laughs> in this uh, webinar. But there are some interesting learnings from the CMA, which has resulted in much, much uh, uh, 
lower prices. And long may it last. I'll leave it there uh, to the season. Brendan, thank you. As you talk about the common currency, I do remember uh, covering a Comesa um, conference. It was in Zimbabwe some years ago, and that conversation started there, talking about a common uh, currency, something like what the uh, West African franc uh, that they have uh, in, in parts of, of West Africa. So that would be an interesting uh, conversation. Advocate uh, Tokwan, I don't know if anything um, you you'd want to pick out from this conversation, uh, from what uh, Brendan has been talking about coming through from the chat. And um, you'll have the last take on this before we talk about the other, you know, major question that we are trying to tackle that has to do with the, the merits or demerits of using average prices. Um, to measure, um, you know, the costs of, of these remittances. I see, for instance, the conversation that uh, Brendan touched on around, um, I see Francois Rode uh, touches on it in the chat. Not all banks in the CMA are using or capable of using the enhanced EFT rail and have reverted back to SWIFT. That cost, as well as additional compliance costs of the required full adherence to the FATF standards could impact the CMA remittance cost upward, yes? So I, 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 admittedly, that, that doesn't mean much uh, to me, uh, it, it phrased in the way that it is, but I imagine that it means a lot to you. Yeah, yes, yes, Tulas. Um, Tulas is, uh, sorry uh, if I pronounce your name incorrectly. Uh, I do understand what Francois is saying, but um, from where what we have seen and observed uh, is that yes, indeed, um, when the in enhanced, what we call an enhanced EFT service uh, was uh, implemented in the CMA, some banks moved out of that 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 service. Essentially, it is uh, the the enhanced EFT service is more like your it is your like your EFT uh, uh, service that you would use in South Africa to pay your accounts to pay for their utilities, et cetera. But uh, that uh, enhanced EFT service is just uh, one of the services that we have in the in the, CM, in the CMA. OK, so that is just to, to, to give context there in terms of the, 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 the enhanced the EFT service. And uh, I don't want to belabor the point. I think my, my colleagues have uh, uh, provided a lot of insight into, into this. If I may move on to the looking at the, the time, move on to the, the second question. Um, from my perspective, I'm not a statistician. Um, it is not a case of neither here nor there, whether we use this methodology or that methodology. However, the, we must ensure that whatever methodology that we use, be it average pricing or be it the, the modal uh, price methodology that's been proposed that we, that we use, we should ensure that uh, across the industry, we have consistency in terms of reporting. That is one. And then the second thing is that we should ensure that uh, we've got uh, the historic historical view of these prices as we track them over the, the, the years. I would imagine that the average pricing model have been used over the over the years. My view is that we should not throw it out. We should uh, uh, use it. However, I like the analysis that we have today that it has unpacked uh, and gave a lot of insight in terms of that uh, when you go into the granular level, you are able to see uh, where you have done your interventions, prices goes down in terms of averages. And then where you take out averages, as example, you take out the CMA averages from the, the overall static averages, you get a true cost of um, or got a different view uh, uh, in, uh, uh, what called of uh, pricing in 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 SARIC. and lastly, the important thing is that uh, when we talk about this pricing methodologies, it must make sense to the end user out there that would interrogate this average price and said, "I want to uh, remit money. What is the average price that I am going to pay?" If we make it very 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 technical to an extent that the average user and may not be in a position to discern what that price say, we might uh, uh, 
be failing in our uh, duty of care to, to, to our end users or remittance users. Thank you. That will be my uh, closing um, statement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Advocate. Uh, without wasting any time, let's take it to you, Mr. Natarajan. What's your thinking around the methodology? Um, does it matter? And if so, why does it matter? Uh, what kind of consensus do we need? around which methodology is appropriate? Yes, no, I think this is a very, uh, very age old debate, not just with respect to remittance supplies, but with a lot of other things in life. Um, average is always um, kind of uh, easy to measure, but then there are a lot of pitfalls and uh, and it needs to be interpreted with care. Um, so I think there are there are a couple of points here. I think one is um, the UN targets is about the global average uh, for the corridor level. Issue, like in terms of for one corridor to for one sending country to another sending country, uh, there's there's a different methodology which is used, which is called the smart average, and then I'll talk about that. So I think uh, at the global level, get the all the underlying information required to calculate a weighted average is, is very difficult. I would not say impossible, but I would say it's it's very 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 difficult, and it's going to be very expensive. And I think it is a weighted average is not just weighted of different providers, but also one needs to look at each provider offers multiple services. You know? So if you take one particular MTO, they would offer you a cash based remittance. They will offer you a remittance sent through their app. They will offer you a remittance sent through a bank channel. And similarly, if you take a bank, they might offer you different different services. So you, if you really want to do a weighted average, then you also need to be then weighting it by the services, not just by the providers. You know? uh, and that level of granularity of information, I think it is not very easy to get. Um, so, um, so, but at the same time, we recognize the issues related to uh, the average price. So I think our effort has been to uh, the, the World Bank as part of the limited supplies the worldwide database. Our effort has been to provide as much disaggregated information as possible to allow the computation of weighted averages in countries where they can. You know? So we provide, for example, in the limited supplies the worldwide database um, for all the different um, providers and different services and different products which can be used to to send remittances. Uh, the information for each one of them is listed. And if the and if the uh, country authority has the has the market shares, then they can of course compute it uh, for their own policy uh, for their own policy decisions, and also to see the different market movements. Um, now, when you come to the uh, the concept of a weighted average with respect to a global uh, concept, I think we do calculate a weighted average for global as well. But I think there there is a, there's a very tricky issue which I think we need to be careful about. Uh, what if you have a very um, very heavy very large corridor? A large volume, a large value corridor. We have a small value corridor. The improvements are all in the large value corridor and they're not in the small value corridor. And you miss that when you do a weighted average. You get a false sense of complacency that everything is going well, but it's but there's a small minority who are continuing to face a high cost, which is the case which uh, the colleague from Madagascar rightly pointed out. So I think there are pitfalls with weighted average as well, but at a corridor level, the weighted average issue might not be, uh, the, the pitfalls might not be as much with weighted average. But the challenge is more related to do it at a global scale. I think weighted average is always challenging. So that's why from the World Bank perspective, we have in our, in our tool, we have disaggregated the information to the, to the extent possible and make it available so that uh, one can compute a weighted average if needed. But what we try to do, of course, is that the sample matters, right? When you do an average, the sample also matters. So I think as long as the sample is representative, the difference between the weighted and the sample uh, and the average could actually be uh, could come down. It might not be as wide as one would anticipate. So I think um, in addition to the point about weighted versus average, I think one also needs to look at the sample composition. And I think that's where I think our effort has been at the global level to ensure that the sample composition is representative of the of the market shares in the corridor, that we are not uh, you know, so oversampling banks versus oversampling non-banks and, and, and so on, right? Um, and then the other element, other issue with respect to weighted average is that it can be very noisy. The market share can change from quarter to quarter, um, and uh, they could be long term. There could be shifts in market share, but over the short term, there could be quite a bit of noise which could come uh, through market share fluctuations, and, and one needs to be careful about that. So I think uh, it, I would conclude um, with a very, very smart way of framing it by Magedi, Magedi to saying it is neither this nor that. I think one needs to look at all the different combinations. Now I would emphasize more the point about giving disaggregated information so that researchers and policymakers can can compute uh, and interpret the data the way they need to interpret. I think a related point which was made in the presentation, if you allow me, um, 
is on the on the on the uh, on the amount of remittances or the, or the value of remittances which is used. Way back in 2011, um, the in the in the in the wisdom of the uh, the G20 and the other players involved at that point in time, I think the figure of two thousand two hundred dollars and five hundred dollars was chosen, and that was the average remittance which was being sent at that point of time. Over a period of time, of course, uh, clearly things have changed. Um, there are calls from some countries to include thousand dollars because that is what is representative in their context. Some countries have called for fifty dollars. Some have called for hundred. So I think the question is like, what do you do, right? So, uh, so that's why again, uh, we have stuck to the two hundred and five hundred dollars, but we are evaluating whether on a case by case basis we can do uh, to a different um, a different uh, price points. But also, we are using what is called as what can we perhaps uh, loosely call as a constant currency rate. So we are using the currency exchange rate as it existed in 2011. So, uh, so in the case of South Africa, South Africa, for example, we are computing the cost for sending rand 1,370 and 1,310, which corresponded to $200 and $500 in 2011. Now, because of exchange rate changes, this has become 940 because because this is this has perhaps become something like uh, $90 uh, for $200 in Poland now. And, if, and and something uh, something different for five hundred, so and this is uh, very close to um, what you were mentioning. Uh, Fifty five dollars is the current uh, average size of remittances. And if you go, if you go by the logic I'm mentioning, uh, I'm I'm, I'm uh, explaining here. I think we are basically measuring the average cost of sending dollar uh, ninety four uh, at the current currency equivalent. So this is not very way off from what one is talking about. And then also I think um, as the, uh, as the uh, size of the remittance increases. The average, the cost comes down. So, if at all, if if anything, we are perhaps um, kind of underreporting on our pricing compared to what you're saying. Um, so, I think uh, so. In that sense, one one needs to really look at more the, the directionality rather than the absolute values. Sometimes, when you look at some of uh, some, some of these global indices, right? Uh, and in 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 conclusion, um, let me just talk about the smart average. The smart average is really about it starts to bring in this concept of. You have lower prices in a particular corridor, but they might not necessarily be used. And the weighted average will not do justice to that because the weight will be very low. So well, the smart average tries to look at, is this service accessible to the senders and receivers? So if you have a mobile money service and only 1% of the population in the sending country has access to mobile money or, or on the receiving side, then this is not included in the smart average. So what is included is one, a service which is uh, technically accessible Technically and operationally accessible to vast majority of the of the senders and recipients, then we'll take the average of that, and that average is very close to the weighted average, which um, Anita was mentioning, uh, and kind of uh, the double was mentioning, uh, and that that weighted average is actually currently stands at, um, uh, at less than five percent currently uh, on a, on a global level, uh, and it is important to note that even if you go by that metric, some of the corridors in uh, SADC, the prices are quite high. It goes in the range of like about 10 in some some cases, and in some cases it is, is 9 and 7%. So I think one needs to look at the smart average, the global average, the average for the corridor, and perhaps also the weighted average to, to form a full uh, clear picture of the of the developments in the corridor. So let me stop here. I gave, um, I think, a little elaborate response, but, but I think given the uh, complexity of the topic, I thought it deserved that. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for that, Mr. Natsarajan. Um, Nikki and Nick, if you will allow me, um, let me take an executive decision because we are almost completely out of time and just ask you to then tie it all together for us. Um, why is this conversation about the cost specifically of remittances? Um, if we pack you know, the whole issue of the volumes and values uh, of remittances, but the costs, why is it an important conversation uh, to have as well as the methodology that we're talking about is what, what is the meaning of it all to the fictional character of Tariro that I gave earlier on, who just wants to send a thousand rand, the equivalent thereof, uh, $68 to her mother in Nyamapanda to be able to buy fertilizer. And I think that would be a nice way for us to wrap it together, then uh, hand back to, to, to Brandon. So let me start with you, Nikki, and, and, and Nick, you can then follow immediately after. Thank you. So, and and thank you for all all the comments. And um, while we were talking about this, I also I also was thinking why why is it about the cost? I think that 
that it's important for us to have benchmarks and targets to understand if things are getting better or if things are getting worse. And that was the metric that was chosen. And rightly so, because we are speaking about people that are most vulnerable. Um, and I know we did some maths and maybe Brendan or Damola, they, they can work it out. But the the savings to remitters over the last five years as a result of the drop in prices has been huge and significant. So, so pricing is important. I think from our perspective um, is we need to be a little bit more pragmatic though, because the problem we are trying to solve is to allow money to be sent to mama in the most effective, efficient way at a cost that is appropriate. And therefore, disaggregated data and really understand what is happening is important because it could be far more cost effective for me to use a service. Um, or, so let me ch change my wording. It could be just to use the service to send the money could be very cost effective and that's all we measure. But what we forget is to use that service, I need to get onto a taxi and drive 20 kilometers, use that service and send it. And we don't take that into account. So I think that we need to understand the problem we're trying to solve when we're looking at this data and be very pragmatic and careful in understanding it. Because if I've taken a taxi to drive 20 kilometers to use the cheapest, it, it hasn't worked for me. Or if the person receiving it has had to do. So what is the problem we're trying to solve? And it really is about ensuring the most vulnerable can get the most accessible in the most transparent way money to their loved ones that need it, generally for consumption, because that's what our, our information is showing us. And therefore, we may need to be just a little more pragmatic. I hope that pulled it together for you. Thanks. Thanks, Nikki. Uh, I'm not sure what I'm going to add to that because, uh, I mean, that's what we care about, right? Um, exactly. It's actually the purpose of the remittances. I mean, the fertilizer is a good example, but a lot of our customers send money for hospital, you know, fees and school fees for food. Um, so very basic services. And actually, you look at $55 per transaction, and it's pretty low uh, when, when you think about um, us in probably on that call, right? And, and you know, if you can add an, an additional dollar, which is 2%, more or less, right, to that, it doesn't seem like big, but actually for the people receiving the money, it's massive. Um, so that's why I think the cost matters. That's why it really matters, and you know, that's why we're trying to, to reduce it. Obviously, at the end of the day, we're also businesses and we need to, to, to make sure that we can carry on investing, but like, that's why at the end of the day, that, that cost matters. And I think there's also history there, and, and the frustration probably from, especially, like, I think, international organizations around the cost of remittance and you know we came 50 years ago when there was just a handful of providers charging like probably ridiculous amounts maybe also banks and no offense to, to, to banks you know they we work with them and we're very happy with them but like that, that there's a like a historical frustration but i think what's important right now is like why are we doing it like that impact um uh, in the in the on the recipient side we talked about gender right i think um on the receiving side there's a lot more women receiving money um uh, and, and now women are starting to send, but I think women also receive, receive a lot. And, and I think the trend is very important, you know, and I'm looking at 2030, which is a very technocratic objective that, that has been taken, and it's great that it's been done. But for customers, I don't think, I mean, our customers at least, I don't think they really understand the UN and the SDGs and all of that. You know, what they look is what, what is how much money they're going to receive. Um, I, think, I think the trend is very important. I think we're on the, on the right trend. If, if we carry on at, at that speed, we, we reach 5% way before 2030. Um, so, so I think we're on, on, on the right trend. Well, thank Maybe you for I, that. Can I just add one yes. something? I think we're going to look at opening Madagascar. Mm. Just saying for the <laughs> <friend though. laughs> All right, I like that. Um, uh, uh, the uh, comments that came in through uh, our chat a bit earlier on. That's a very optimistic and a positive note to end it on, um, and I'm really appreciative of that. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we'll leave it there because, you know, if you left it to me, this conversation could go on 
for another hour <laughs> because I'm learning so much and, and, and growing in the process as well. I've got to thank my panelists, Harish Natarajan uh, from the World Bank. Thank you uh, for waking up and taking the call with us. Uh, Advocate Mahedi Titus Tokwane from the South African Reserve Bank. Uh, we truly appreciate your participation. Mr. Nicholas Vontron uh, from Mama Money. Uh, thank you for taking part and, and, and weighing in on these conversations. And Nikki Kettles uh, from Finmark Trust, thank you for your time and your insights. Uh, Brendan, I think I'm handing back to you, as we say in my industry, back to studio. <laughs> yes, thank you very much to Lassizu. That was a great uh, uh, panel. And, and as you say, we, we could chat about these things for a long time, given the passion that we, you know, that we have for it. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, all of this work goes towards us laying, I think, a firm basis for, you know, the regional integration agenda within the SADC region, which I believe is the future for all our countries. So the shenanigans, the political shenanigans around migrants and all of that, I'm hoping we get over it very quickly and we see the bigger picture because there actually is a bigger picture here. So thank you for, for, for the panel and the, and, the, and, the, and the input you've provided. We will continue the work. Uh, we will be working with this agenda for the next 10 years. Maybe I won't be here. I'll, I'll be. I'm going to 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 leave as well at some point. Uh, but we. So so this work will also lay the basis for our work in the informal cross border trader uh, work that we are tackling next. If you think the volumes that move across borders for remittances is high, you should look at the informal cross border trade. It's about three or four times higher than that. Women, uh, informal, small amounts of trade, but is an important livelihood. Thank you very much. I have to hand over to Nikki Kettles, who you now know very well. She's going to close close the uh, to close the meeting for us. Harish is very tired. I can see his head <laughs> too early. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Harish, for joining us. Nikki, over to you. Thank you. So thank you very much um, to everybody that attended. Um, to all of our stakeholders that uh, uh, pr provided the insightful information and allowed us to just really knock on their doors all the time to check and recheck and recheck. Um, the, the, the trends are important. What is happening is important. This work is very important to the region. Um, and we feel, as Brendan said, incredibly passionate about it. We've been doing it for 10 years. We are not bored. We are going to carry on doing it for another 10 years and um, with all of our partners. I mean, Harish, we've been working together for a few years and it's been great. So we, we, we need to continue on this important agenda. I think the one thing we must keep going back to is we must remember these are the most vulnerable people. So you know, Angola, an average of 20,000 grand cent per transaction, that's not a vulnerable migrant. You know, that, that really is not a vulnerable migrant. And that should not be put into these databases when we look at the averages. We really need to focus on what we're trying to do with this information and to focus on the agenda of supporting the vulnerable migrants. Um, we have lots of information. We're running quite a few programs. If there's anyone who would like some specific information, please you can email myself or Demola or Brendan. Um, we love to share it. We love to talk about it. And if there are any other topics you'd be interested on um, cross-border remittances, we'd love to start running these more often and actually getting people together to talk about what is happening in the industry. Because I think that's the way, you know, this, ha this momentum happens. We we've got a huge number of stakeholders that we already engage with and maybe we need to just carry on bringing everybody together. So thank you very, very much um, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Cheers. Bye-bye.